What was the scariest moment of your life? And what was at stake if things didn't go well? In today's episode of the Following Jesus podcast, we're looking at what's most likely the scariest moment of Esther's life, where if things don't go well, she will literally be killed for it. So what happens and what lessons can we apply to our own lives? Hi, my name is David Cipriano. I'm a youth pastor and my goal is to teach the Bible to as many people as possible. We're currently in the middle of a podcast series through the book of Esther, so here's some context before we get into chapter 5. Back in chapter 3, there was a Jewish man named Mordecai. Mordecai was Esther's cousin who had raised her since she was an orphan, and he also worked for the kingdom. But in his work at the kingdom, he refused to bow to a man named Haman, and in a very extreme act of revenge, Haman decides to have Mordecai killed along with all the other Jewish people. So he bribes the king Ahasuerus and he puts the decree in place to systemically wipe out all of the Jewish people who were living in the Persian Empire. So in chapter 4, Mordecai goes to Queen Esther and he challenges her to reverse this decree, but Esther tells him that she can't. She wasn't allowed to go to the king uninvited because if she did and he didn't hold out the golden scepter, then she would be killed for doing so. Being the queen did not exempt Esther from this rule, because life as the queen of Persia wasn't all that great, and she hadn't seen her own husband in 30 days. So from her perspective, she's powerless to make a difference in this situation. But Mordecai gives her the famous words for such a time as this. God had placed Esther in the Persian Empire for this moment. God had placed a Jew there to help save all of the other Jews, and God wanted to use Esther to save her people from destruction. And even though things seemed impossible and dangerous and extremely unlikely, Esther decides to go to the king, and she gives this brave resolution, if I perish, I perish. She's going to risk her life trying to save her people, and in chapter 5, where we're looking at today, we're going to see what happens when she does so. Chapter 5 is the moment of truth. Everything in the story so far has been leading up to this moment. So here's what verse 1 of chapter 5 says. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. Esther's people are all about to die. They've been sentenced to die by the government. There's even a date that they're going to be executed, and the destruction of the Jewish people in Persia is seemingly inevitable. And Esther going to the king to try to reverse this decision is like their only chance. And they weren't really super confident in this chance, because Esther wasn't allowed to go to the king. Her and the king weren't very close, they hadn't even seen each other in a month, and there is a very real possibility that when Esther goes to the king to reverse his decree, she could be killed for doing so. So after fasting and praying for three days in preparation for this moment, now is the time to go to the king. And Esther had already made the decision, if I perish, I perish. Esther had come to the place where she just had to step out of the boat in faith. You see, it's easy to say that you have faith, but your faith is really tested when that moment of truth comes. Tough circumstances reveal your true courage. And sometimes we might say that we believe, we might say that we have faith, we might say, I would do this if the situation ever came up, but it's these moments of truth in life where our true character is revealed. When it comes to to lie who we really are. Esther had decided days before to go to the king, and now is the moment of truth. Now is the time when her faith is really being put to the test. And so Esther goes to the king, and this meeting was really a long shot because, as I said before, they weren't close, she wasn't allowed to go to him, and the law of the Medes and Persians was an irreversible law. If you remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den, the king wasn't able to reverse 
reverse that decree so that Daniel wouldn't have to go. And this is the same kind of system that we see here in Esther's story. And there's a lot of reasons why this meeting might not work out, but it's the Jews only hope. It's like taking that full court shot at the buzzer. And Esther's conclusion last chapter was that if I perish, I perish. This story really highlights Esther's faith because when the time comes, when that moment of truth is here, she doesn't give up. She doesn't chicken out. Sometimes in life, we make a decision to do something, but when the time comes and after we've had more time to wait longer and to think about it, it becomes harder to do the thing. Sometimes we'll have a lot of faith for a moment, but the faith doesn't last. Sometimes we make this really big decision. Sometimes we make these really great commitments for God, but sometimes our faith runs out very quickly. And yet Esther's faith is not like that. This was a faith that lasted. It's been days since she made the decision, and yet now we see her keeping her commitment. Because it's one thing to commit to do something, and it's another thing to actually do the thing. As a youth pastor, every time I take our teenagers to camp, I always remind them, don't let your decisions just be decisions. Because often, and I've even done this myself many times, we'll go to these camps and these conferences and these revival meetings and we'll decide to do something, but then we end up not following through. Maybe we forgot about it. Maybe we don't feel as strongly about it anymore. Maybe we realize that it might be harder to do than it seemed in the moment of the decision. But the real true test of faith is not in making the decision, but in keeping it. Esther made a great decision in chapter 4, and now the time has come to keep that decision. In the last chapter, she says, if I perish, I perish. And that's a lot of faith. But the true test of faith is not in making the commitment, but in following it. And I think it's evident here that Esther displays more faith in chapter 5 than she does in chapter 4, because chapter 4 was a decision. It's a resolution. But in chapter 5 is where she really follows through. This was the decision that Esther had made days before. And when your life is on the line and you could literally die for it, that's a lot of time to think about it. It's a lot of time to reconsider. It's a lot of time to back out at the last minute. And yet she doesn't. She has a faith that lasts. And in verse 2, the Bible tells us, and it was so, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. So when the moment of truth comes and Esther has the faith and the courage to go to the king, the king holds out the golden scepter, meaning that Esther doesn't have to die. She was welcomed in his presence. And not only was she welcomed, but it seems that the king was happy to see her because she obtained obtain favor in his sight. And I've been saying this in a lot of the episodes previously, and I'm going to keep saying it, but we see the hand of God evidence all throughout the story. And I believe that it was God's hand and God's providence that helped Esther the queen obtain favor in the king's sight. Because from the details that Esther gave before, it seems like it might not be this way. He hasn't spoken to her in a while. She had a real threat of losing her life just for going to see her husband. And yet when she goes to see him and she's unannounced, she's uninvited, she obtains favor in his sight. And to me, this is one of the evidences that God is working behind the scenes. God was working out all of the little details to work out his sovereign plan. And when Esther goes to the king, she makes a request. Verse 3 says, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther, and what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. So we see here that when Esther goes to the king, even though it was a very scary moment, things end up going way better than she could have imagined. And I think that a parallel can be made in our lives. God wants to do great things in our lives, but we have to ask. And this is not a prosperity gospel. And this is not me saying that God will always give us our every whim and our every desire. But the reality is that God wants to do things for us and through us 
us, but we have to ask. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And for us to ask and receive great things from God, we have to ask in faith. We have to be believing that God can. And Hebrews 4, 16 gives us this challenge. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we go to God, we can go to him boldly. We can go boldly because we're his child, because he loves us, because he cares about us, because God is a promise keeper, and we can find mercy from God. We can find grace from him. God wants us to go to him and ask for things. God wants for us to have a lot of faith. He wants for us to make those big, impossible prayer requests. And consider this for a moment. When was the last time you asked God for something that seemed impossible? Because often we just pray for what seems easy. We ask God to do things that he's already done. We ask him for what seems possible. But we have a God of the impossible. And when we make requests, God often gives us even more than what we asked for. And here's a request that Esther makes. Now this will not be her only request that she'll make throughout the greater story but it's the first one that she makes. Verses 4 and 5 say, And Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Esther makes her requests in faith. Esther was prepared. And notice through these verses that she had already prepared a banquet for the two men. She was asking in faith. She was prepared to receive the thing that she asked for. It's like the story of the farmer who goes to church for a prayer meeting to pray for rain. And the farmer brought the umbrella because he had faith that God would answer his prayer. We need to be praying in faith. We need to pray believing. And Esther makes her request in confidence. She was already prepared to be given her request because she asked the king and Haman to come to a banquet and the banquet has already been prepared. The banquet was that day and she was prepared in anticipation. And at the banquet that evening, Esther requests that the king and Haman come to another banquet the next day. And at the next day's banquet, that's when she'll make her real ask. And it might seem odd that she doesn't make the main request now. Maybe we think that she's starting to get scared. Maybe she's starting to hesitate. But we'll see in the next chapter that there's a real purpose behind this. And again, I see God's evidence here in that God is still working out more details behind the scenes. And it's a good thing that Esther doesn't try to change the decree this first evening because that night after the banquet is over, something's going to happen that will change things. Now, it's interesting to notice that both times she talks to the king in this chapter, he tells her that it shall be granted even to the half of the kingdom, meaning that she was welcome, she was allowed to ask for things, things were going really well for Esther. This was God rewarding her for her faith. This was God blessing her for her courage because she knew that she could die. But when she takes those steps of faith, God works out the details and things are going to go even better than she could have imagined. And it's at this point in the story when the focus moves from Esther to Haman. Remember that Haman is the villain of the story. He's the antagonist. And over the course of just a few verses, we see that Haman's emotions and his actions take this wild ride. Haman is going all over the place. He's going through the highs and the lows. And we notice four things in Haman. First was his excitement. Because around this idea of the exclusive banquet with the king and the queen, it says in verse 9, then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. And for those of us who maybe know how the story ends, it's ironic that Haman is so excited because he doesn't know the purpose of the meeting. The purpose of the meeting was to expose Haman and his evil plot. It was to reverse the decree that he had just put in place. And at the banquet, there's going to be this really uncomfortable, really awkward moment for him. But right now, he's oblivious to this and he's really excited because he feels special. Remember that Haman is obsessed with power, with image,
bondage, with control, because this was an exclusive banquet with the king and the queen of the world's most powerful nation, and he was the only other one who was invited. And at this point, Haman has already had one banquet, and he would have another banquet the next day. In the beginning of verse 9, Haman's on cloud 9, but he comes down really quickly in that same verse. Here's what the whole verse says. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart, but when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Notice here that Mordecai is still taking a stand. Mordecai is still doing what's right. Even though Mordecai had been sentenced to death, and even though his entire people group had been, he still wasn't compromising. He still wasn't giving in. He still wasn't bowing to Haman. He was still standing. And because of this, Haman feels very angry. He's angry because of one thing. Haman is bitter. He's consumed with wrath, all because of Mordecai. And from the details of the story, Mordecai seems to be the one person who wouldn't idolize him. Haman's whole world revolves around himself, but Mordecai isn't playing along with the game. And notice Haman's immaturity here, because no matter how great everything else was in his life, it's all ruined because of one thing. One thing that shouldn't have really been a big deal in the first place. One man isn't bowing and it's causing him to just lose it. And I think that sometimes we're guilty of the same mistake. We'll make a big deal out of nothing sometimes. Maybe a good question to ask yourself on a bad day is, did you have a bad day or did you have a bad five minutes? Did you have an entirely bad day or did you really just have one bad moment that ruined your whole day? And so often we'll let these small things ruin everything and that's what Haman's doing here. He's angry because of one person's opinion. He's letting one person's response to him control his life. This is a man who is obsessed with what people think. It's easy for us to recognize in other people's stories how we shouldn't let one person's opinion or one person's thoughts control our lives. But really, how often do we do the same thing? How often do we live our lives thinking about what other people think, letting other people's potential thoughts control us? This is what Haman's doing because his whole life seems to be ruined because one person won't bow to him. But how often do we do the same thing in our lives? One person will make a comment to us and it totally changes our worldview. Sometimes we'll change everything about our lives just because of what people might think. We'll talk like them, we'll act like them, we'll dress like them, all in the hopes of getting another person's approval. Hey, we shouldn't be living like this. We should be more concerned about what God thinks than what other people think. Because people didn't die for us. People don't love us unconditionally like God does. And their opinions don't matter as much as you think they do. And the reality is that they're probably not thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you. Haman, for a moment, he feels really excited, but then he becomes angry because of Mordecai. And this leads to the third thing we notice in him, and it's his pride. Here's what verses 10 to 12 say. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself, and when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king, Haman said moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Haman is bragging about everything in his life, not just the banquet. He's talking about all of his accomplishments as if his friends didn't already know. He's talking about the glory of his riches, the multitude of his children, the promotions he had gotten from the king, how he was advanced above the princes and the servants, and now how he's been invited to two exclusive banquets with the king and queen. And aside from the banquets, his wife and his friends would have already known about all of those things. This is not new information to them, but Haman's life was all about himself. Haman never missed an opportunity to brag. He was a narcissist who thought the whole whole world revolved around him. So every chance he gets, Haman wants to talk about himself, how great he is, how powerful he is 
how influential he is. He makes everything about himself. He was a type of guy who was always bragging. He was always bragging about his accomplishments, his job, his promotion. Everything was all about him. Hey, all of us, we need to beware of pride in our lives because pride is the reason why Haman does so many of the things that he does. Here's what the Bible says about pride. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is so destructive because we often don't realize that we're full of it. We hate to see pride in others, but we love to have pride ourselves. You see, pride is not always bragging and boasting and acting more important than others. Pride is a focus on self that makes everything all about you. Some of us are consumed with thoughts about ourselves. How do I look? How did I do? What do they think? Pride takes on a lot of different forms, and we see a lot of these forms in Haman because Haman is commanding people to bow to him. He's angry when one person doesn't. Haman is constantly bragging. He's consumed with himself. And all of this anger and this pride leads him to number four, which is revenge. Here's what Haman says in verses 13 and 14. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet, and the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. With Haman, his life is just a constant back and forth. He's excited, he's angry, he's excited again, he's angry again. Haman has no handle over his emotions emotions. He wasn't ruling his emotions. His emotions were ruling him. Haman might have a lot of political control, but he doesn't have much self-control because he's angry. He's reactionary. He makes a big deal out of nothing. And Haman seeks revenge through hanging Mordecai on the gallows. Revenge often goes way farther than the original offense. Some of us have the mentality that I don't get even, I get ahead. See, revenge starts this never ending cycle where somebody does something wrong to you, so you want to do wrong back at them. And when you get your revenge and they have to get their revenge and you have to get your revenge again, revenge is like this never ending cycle. But here's what Jesus said for us to do. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus wants for us to love our enemies. If they do wrong to us, we should still be nice to them. We should love our enemies, those who curse us, those who hate us, those who despitefully use us, those who persecute us. God wants for us to love all people. Nobody is excluded from this group. And yet we find the exact opposite of that in Haman, because Haman is seeking revenge on Mordecai. He's building a gallows 75 feet high so that everybody can see what happens to the man who dares to stand against the mighty Haman, and Haman doesn't realize it yet, but these gallows will later be used to hang him. Haman is digging his own pit. It's been said that bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person gets sick, and the reality is that bitterness and revenge will often hurt you more than they hurt the other person, because it doesn't ruin their life as much as it ruins yours, and the thing that you're doing that you think will hurt them, it's going to hurt you much worse. And this situation between Mordecai and Haman is going to be flipped. And it's going to be something that neither one of them ever would have expected. You see, a major storyline in the story of Esther is this conflict between Haman and Mordecai. And in next Monday's episode, we're looking at chapter 6, where we see a wild turn of events. The tables are going to turn, and nobody would have expected what would happen. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Following Jesus podcast, and subscribe for more biblical teaching.